So real quick before we get into this episode, I just wanna add that since researching and writing the script, Marjorie Taylor Greene has continued to spread homophobic misinformation about monkeypox, which was stuff she started to spew after I had already recorded this. To make a long story short, she made false connections between monkeypox and child SA, which as Alejandra Caraballo, an attorney and clinical instructor at Harvard Law School's Cyber Law Clinic pointed out, it can absolutely result in violence against LGBTQ plus people. She's also advocated for Christian nationalism, which insert this tasty soundbite right here. Uh, We need to be the party of nationalism and I'm a Christian and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. But basically she does not believe in a separation of church and state. Both she and Trump have been pushing this right-wing ideology with Green saying that leftists hate God and the latter stating, quote, because we are Americans and Americans kneel to God and God alone. Unfortunately, I don't doubt that even as this episode comes out, there's gonna be even more dangerous misinformation and rhetoric being spread by her since uploading this episode. So I'll definitely have more to cover and I apologize that I'm not gonna be able to cover these specific things. But with that being said, enjoy today's episode. It was February 14th, 2018, and it started as just a normal Valentine's Day. Kids sprinted into schools excited to spread the love with their homemade cards and adorable candy snacks for all their friends. But what started as a day of joy and love quickly morphed into something else. Just after 2 p.m., a shooter entered a high school in Parkland. Draped with an AR-15, he stalked through the school and subjected the students and teachers to six minutes of sheer terror. The day quickly turned into a somber and horrific day in the United States the Parkland school shooting had joined the ranks of Columbine and Sandy Hook. By the end of the day, 17 people were dead and another 17 were wounded. What happened next was something we truly had never seen before after this type of tragedy. The students quickly started to band together and became strong activists for gun safety legislation in the country. One student, David Hogg, seemed to stand out from the crowd. He was a reporter with the school newspaper and his interview with CNN on the day of the shooting quickly grabbed the world's attention. It was horrifying, but inspiring. While it was difficult to watch a young survivor on the news pleading for help and long overdue change just hours after what was likely the most traumatic day of his life, the country watched in awe as he eloquently described the need for action. Soon, the survivors from the shooting had grown to become formidable forces in the fight for gun safety in the country. But while most people cheered them on and hoped they would win their fight for a safer society, Others decided it was finally time to crawl out of the darkened trench which molded them into the festering entity of hate they are and voice their unwanted opinions. Enter Marjorie Taylor Greene. While the rest of the world mourned the loss of 17 innocent lives, she was devising a theory that the Parkland shooting was a hoax perpetuated by the vile Democrats to force the country's hand to finally enact gun legislation. This was two years before she would be elected and become one of the most controversial politicians in the US. Green, who was already well known for her controversial conspiracy theories and connection with QAnon, decided to sit down with Georgia Gun Owners Incorporated for an interview. It was on this day that she mocked the new young activist, David Hogg. She called him an idiot and told the group that, He is very trained. He's like a dog. He's completely trained. Then she admitted to stalking and confronting the young activist. The longer the interview goes on, the worse it actually gets. She claims that the women working with Hogg were clueless and that giving up their gun rights would strip them of the only thing that was protecting them. You're trying to get rid of the right to protect yourself from being abused, from being raped, from being taken over by a tyrannical government. I don't have press coverage. No one's covering my story. I want my second amendment, but none of you people are covering my voice. You're only covering their voice because they're paid for. By the way, David Hogg was not proposing an all out ban on firearms. Just like how most people aren't calling for an all out ban on guns. All he was asking for was some common sense gun safety legislation. That was it. All he called for was action. Over and over, he repeated the words action. No more thoughts and prayers. Those weren't and still aren't saving kids' lives. Just action. You can find it if you look at his CNN interview or basically anything he said since. But people like Green never seem to hear that. They hear they're stealing our guns and run with it. Still, in one swift quote, MTG blamed women, the press and claimed the teen activists who again had just survived one of the deadliest mass school shootings in the country's history were just paid actors. But she was right about one thing. She wasn't getting the press, at least not at the time. So as she spewed on the absolute bullshit and degrading comments that were leaving her mouth, the world was none the wiser. However, that would all change and this would become just one of her hundreds of wild, outlandish and insulting comments and actions. Because that's right, of all things we're gonna be talking about today, today's subject is Marjorie Taylor Greene. 
or to be honest here, as much as we can because God damn, does she talk a lot and not shut up. Hello everyone and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the life, political career and insane controversies of Marjorie Taylor Greene. There never seems to be a dull moment with this conspiracy queen and we won't have time to go through the muck of it. We'd be here all day or potentially even longer, but we'll go through some of the more interesting cesspits she seems to enjoy digging up for the world to unfortunately bear witness to. So how did someone with connections to QAnon get elected to the US government? Who was she before? How the hell did we get here? Well, let's start with her campaigning. There's nothing quite like shooting an AR-15 from a Humvee at the word socialism in a campaign ad. Why stick with the boring standard style of walking through a park with cheery stock music or standing in front of an American flag as a patriotic choir of children sing praise? No, 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 no. Why do that when you could blow up a sign? An explosion makes a neuron activate after all, right? The words stop socialism are proudly vomited across all stickers, pins, bumper decals, and anything on display as MTG advertises her campaign in 2019. Her big goal was to spread her message of creating new jobs and running the country as a profitable customer focused business. She should know how to do this, she tells everyone. She's a successful business owner, a kick ass businesswoman, a girl boss, if you would. Well, that's what she says at least. But how true is that? Does anyone want to venture a guess as to how she got into business? Did she build it herself with good old American bootstraps pulling those up, blood, sweat, and tears? Well, no, of course she didn't. Despite her consistent insistence on being a successful business person during her campaign, that's not actually the case. For four years, she was listed as the CFO of her father's business. While she went through her campaign, her team went about writing letters to her opponents, outlining her important role in her father's company. But the journal AJC decided to do some digging. After looking through 20 years of Taylor Commercial's website history, they found her listed nowhere. She's not one of the executives on the website and she's not even included in any of the archives that discuss the company story. Her husband is there, he's listed everywhere. He's even got a fancy little businessman picture and standing next to Marjorie Taylor Greene's own father and was the president before he took over as CEO. But her, no. No daughter daddy business pictures for her. And that just seems a bit odd that a person that declared herself a massive success was conveniently a ghost on her own father's company website. Talk about some serious daddy issues there. Another company, Prestwick Development, had worked with Taylor Commercial repeatedly in 2012. But the CEO of that company told AJC, if Marjorie Taylor Greene walked in front of me, then I would not have known her. Hmm. Well, that doesn't sound like the involved and pivotal role in the company that she's continually told her opponents and her voters that she had. She had other businesses, but those weren't the best. Sure, they made money, but it was based on affordable housing credits, which civil rights attorney Michael Daniel called a cascade of cash. Who would have guessed that the massively hypocritical and pull them up by their bootstraps, Marjorie Taylor Greene took advantage of people in poverty and, (gasps) dare I say it, government tax credits to make her fortune? Whatever happened to not relying on big government handouts to survive? Wait, hold on, hmm. Marjorie, I thought government handouts, like, I don't know, tax breaks or stimulus checks, you know, those things you opposed but always took money from were socialism, according to you and your friends. Is this another campaign promise falling flat? Hmm, I don't know, just a thought. Now, obviously I must have missed the memo that as long as you take advantage of other people while also taking advantage of government handouts, then it's okay. So. Whoopsie, my bad. She also apparently created her own gym, which was relatively successful. But as for her involvement in her father's company, that definitely seems overstated or an all out lie. Either one, not sure, can't fully confirm, but it doesn't seem to be what she tried to describe herself as. Now, what is interesting is just two weeks before she officially announced her candidacy for Congress, her name spontaneously reappeared on the company's website. So while I'm not calling her a liar, I'm not calling her a truther either. This is just the tip of the iceberg with her though. And it's not surprising that she would use the businesswoman persona. I mean, the businessman persona certainly worked for someone else. Name rhymes with chump, can't think of it right now. But what else was Marjorie up to during, you know, her pre-political life? Well, as you may have guessed, she was active in the world of conspiracy theories. In 2017, Marjorie Taylor Greene worked as a correspondent for American Truth Seekers. 
Throughout her 59 posts on the conspiracy website, she spouted the same illogical and downright insane conspiracies we've seen repetitively. In a post titled, Must Read Democratic Party Involved with Child Sex, Satanism, and the Occult, this seems promising, she goes through what she claims as facts, proving that the Democratic Party has become involved with unspeakable actions. But what are these facts? Well, she first claims that the Democratic Party is involved with Satanism because Planned Parenthood and the Satanic Temple teamed up to promote abortion in Missouri. Of course, she called this sickening. Then she claims that the Democratic Party has been linked to occultists, which basically just means witches. Then there was the claim that Hillary Clinton apparently wanted to make voodoo dolls of members of the media and congressmen in response to scandals over her email server. All of her supposed proof came from the Daily Caller. She also had to repeat multiple times that these were not conspiracy theories. And if there's one thing I've learned in my life and throughout my time covering corrupt businesses and MLMs and people of the sorts, it's that if people have to tell you repetitively that something is not what it seems like, then it's probably exactly what it seems like. She continuously wrote posts praising QAnon, even one time writing. Recently, there's been a lot of chatter in small circles among those who search for the truth. There has been an anonymous voice with obvious intelligence beyond the normal person telling of things to come. They call themselves Q. Make no mistake, Q is a patriot. In case you're wondering, literally none of Q's so-called predictions ever came true, but that obviously didn't stop people from hanging on to every word, including a future Congresswoman, yay. So when Marjorie wasn't lying about her businesswoman status, or at least extending the truth a bit, or writing about conspiracy theories, which she claimed were definitely not conspiracy theories, she was spouting racist, xenophobic, and anti-Muslim rhetoric, including comments made explicitly towards her future colleagues. In 2020, Politico released an article detailing the extensive background of Marjorie Taylor Greene, who at the time had just won her primary in Georgia and her continuous stream of horrific comments. Some of these included calling black people, quote, held slaves to the Democratic Party and comparing the Black Lives Matter summer in 2020 to when neo-Nazis and white supremacists march in Charlottesville. Do you remember that? When they planned the Unite the Right rally that ended with a car driving into a crowd, killing one woman and injuring 19 others while people screamed blood and soil and Jews will not replace us? Yeah, that's the comparison. In her criticism of the Black Lives Matter protests, she also said, guess what? Slavery is over. Black people have equal rights. Besides the fact that black people most certainly do not have equal rights in the United States, see voting suppression, criminalization, employment stats, housing, et cetera, it's also ridiculous that she would compare people protesting because police had just killed someone again to hundreds of white supremacists and Nazis who are protesting because of statues. Like it's not even similar in the slightest. It's not even close, but that's what she's going with. Of course, she also had to push the age old conspiracy theory that Obama was a Muslim who had, and I quote, opened up our borders to an invasion by Muslims. In 2018, she went after her future colleagues, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, who were the first two Muslim women in Congress. She called this an Islamic invasion of the United States government. She claimed that their swearing in was illegitimate because they swore on the Quran, claiming that it had to be sworn in on the Bible. And in case you're wondering, no, you do not have to be sworn in on the Bible. You can literally use anything to be sworn into office. Like you could swear on an umbrella if you so choose. Like that's a genuine rule. What she said was absolute bullshit, just for the record. Now there's a wide range of other things that Marjorie Taylor Greene said even before she was elected. 9-11 was a hoax. George Soros is a man that pays fake protesters. Like the general insane ramblings. If I went through every horrible thing she said and did, again, the list, and even before she got elected, like we'd be here for days. Still, the fact remains that even after all of this came out to the public, she won. Now she has a pivotal role in the United States government and her actions and statements just seem to grow more dangerous, harmful, and concerning by the day. But let's go back to just before she won, when she was the favorite, before moving on to her time in office. It's 2020 right now. The Biden-Trump race is heating up and Marjorie Taylor Greene is the favorite to win her campaign in Georgia. It may be despite her racist, conspiracy theories and xenophobic comments or because of them. Either way, she's a shoe in While other Republican politicians had adamantly spoken out about her candidacy, she secured the only endorsement that seemed to matter at the time, an endorsement from Donald Trump. 
He called her a rising Republican star when congratulating her on the official announcement that she was the upcoming Republican candidate. As she went through her own victory speech, which included calling Nancy Pelosi anti-American and a bitch, the rest of the Republicans in the House of Representatives started to change their tune. What started as adamant disapproval for the incoming QAnon candidate swiftly turned into support. Then as November came along, no one was shocked to find that she had been elected. She played her campaign perfectly. She consistently used her allyship with Trump as a source of trust among her voter demographic and outspent all other candidates through both donations and her own personal funds. You know, the same funds that she grappled with tax breaks and affordable housing credits. But as pretty much everyone predicted, even Republicans, her time in politics has been a time of constant controversies. So let's talk about some of them. Just remember, it's a long list, so I can't cover every single thing. Marjorie's campaign of controversy really began shortly after her election with the January 6th insurrection and the continuous lie that Donald Trump had actually won the election. But we will return to that and get into it in a little more detail in the continuing investigation in just a bit. For now, let's focus on a few other things. Her Twitter during her tenure has caused a variety of issues for her and if I may be so bold, the American people. During COVID-19, she was one of the many that consistently spouted false information and warnings begging people to not mask, not get vaccinated and ignore science. So thanks for that, babe. In 2021, she was suspended from Twitter for the third time in just a few weeks for violating their COVID-19 misleading information statement. Following the release of the vaccine, the general push from the Biden administration to get as many people vaccinated as fast as possible, she warned all of her followers to stay away. In a statement, she wrote, The FDA should not approve the COVID vaccines. She claimed that there was no proof the vaccine was reducing the spread of the virus. And hey, neither do masks apparently. She said the vaccines were failing. During this confusing and scary time for the country, she continued to push the rhetoric that nothing could stop the virus from spreading. It was every person for themselves. Once again, thanks for that. Eventually, Twitter banned her for spreading misinformation, but don't worry, that was just her personal account. She still uses her political account to spew absolute hot garbage on the daily. But this was just the beginning in her commentary on COVID-19. In May of 2021, she said something so offensive that even members of her own party denounced her. And they'll do that a lot in the future too. In an interview with Real America's Voice, when discussing mask mandates in public, she brought up the historical implications of the Nazi Third Reich forcing Jewish people to wear a gold star as a comparison. She explicitly says, quote, "'This is exactly the type of abuse "'that Nancy Pelosi is talking about.'" Then she doubled down on that comparison when she tweeted, "'Vaccinated employees get a vaccination logo, "'just like the Nazis forced Jewish people "'to wear a gold star.'" All of this was in response to the news that a Tennessee supermarket would place a logo on name badges for their employees who had been vaccinated. I don't think I really need to harp on the ridiculousness and the extent of insult that these comments are, but her fellow Republicans certainly did. Shortly after, Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell spoke out against her statement. And I'm just saying, if these two asshats come out to condemn something, then you've clearly messed up. Like that takes a lot. At first, Marjorie saw nothing wrong with what she said. She even kept going and decided to compare the entire Democratic Party to Nazis because yeah, they're the ones that should be compared to fascism at the current moment, like for sure. But after about a month of pretty much everyone in her party denouncing her, she finally decided to rewind that statement. After multiple Democrats threatened to propose legislation to limit her ability to speak to the public, like seriously, she decided it was time to change her tune, sort of. She visited the Holocaust Museum and after doing so said, there is nothing comparable to it. She went on saying, there is no comparison to the Holocaust. And there are words that I have said, remarks that I have made that I know are offensive. And for that, I want to apologize. As nice as that seems, I would have felt a whole lot better if someone in the United States government didn't say something like that in the first place, just saying. But as I said, she only kind of apologized because following that statement, she doubled down on her idea that the Democratic Party was just like Nazis. So, not really any step forward at all. But as always, there is so much more. And of course, with more comes worse. Remember in the beginning when I told you about Marjorie stalking and harassing activist David Hogg? Well, those videos surfaced when she was already well into her term and her continuation of the feud with the activist wasn't doing her any favors. Due to these continued actions and other concerning comments from the politician, even her own party considered barring her from serving in any committees. What were these other comments? Well, I'm glad you asked. One of them included calling 9-11 a hoax and questioning the fact that a plane flew into the Pentagon saying there was no proof. 
because the video evidence, the countless people that saw it happen, I don't know, the giant gaping hole that was in the Pentagon weren't proof enough, I guess. Then there was one about Jewish space lasers, which is one of my favorites only because of just how insane it is. So yeah, by the way, you are not hallucinating. You heard me right. I said Jewish space lasers. Allow me to explain. In 2018, California suffered a horrifying tragedy with the worst wildfires the state had ever seen. People lost their homes, their lives, and all of their belongings. While the people in California were mourning and the whole country watched on in horror, Marjorie Taylor Greene was on Facebook. There, she wrote a post saying that the fires had been caused by a laser from space. She claimed that there were too many coincidences to ignore with the fire. You see, California Governor Jerry Brown apparently was looking to build a high-speed rail in California. What do you need for that? Land. So she theorized that Roger Kimmel, the vice president of Rothschild Incorporated and Governor Jerry Brown teamed up to use a space laser to set the disastrous California fires aflame. In the giant Facebook post, she writes that there is a longstanding relationship between Rothschild, PG&E, which Roger Kimmel is on the board and Jerry Brown. It would be mutually beneficial for them to start the fires. She also claims that there were multiple firsthand accounts of people seeing lasers or blue beams of light causing the fires. When she finally gets to the end, she concludes her post of nonsense by saying, but what do I know? I just read a lot. Obviously, and this goes without saying, that's not what happened, though she was relatively right about PG&E being involved, just not with some sort of insane space laser. After investigations, it was determined that the fire started because of electrical transmission lines, which were owned by the company. Of course, climate change had a lot to do with just how bad the fires got, but she would rather believe in space lasers than the idea of like, hey, we're killing the planet we're living on. One of those is clearly more likely than the other, but to quote her, what do I know? I just read a lot. Safe to say, people weren't exactly fond of her little theory, especially since it once again reeked of anti-Semitism, which seems to be her and other conspiracy theorists MO. As her terrifying comments continued to stack up, people within the government finally decided to take some action against her. In February, 2021, members of the house voted to officially bar her from her prior committee assignments. Despite multiple Republicans talking a big game and claiming they would condemn her for her continuous stream of harmful actions and comments, only 11 of them voted to strip her of her committee assignments. Meanwhile, all of the Democrats voted for it. The vote came mere hours after Marjorie had finally apologized for all the things she had said, including, by the way, the idea that some members of the Democratic Party should be killed. Seriously, that um, also happened, unfortunately. Earlier in the week, she and McCarthy had a meeting to discuss the upcoming vote. He had proposed to the Democrats that she should be allowed to keep at least one of her committee roles, despite saying that he would unequivocally condemn Green's many controversial remarks about school shootings, political violence, and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Still, the Democrats said no, and despite McCarthy's supposed condemnation of Green, he didn't support her being stripped of her committee power. Shocking. By the way, and in case you were wondering, one of the committees that she was a part of was the Committee on Education and Labor. To clarify, A conspiracy theorist who believes, or at least did believe, that space lasers caused a wildfire, mass shootings are a hoax, and masks are as bad as the Holocaust was on a committee on education and labor. How in the hell did that even happen? Now, despite Marjorie Taylor Greene claiming she no longer believes these things and that they were all said before she became a politician, she was finally held accountable nonetheless. Still, it's not like she's been lacking in controversial theories since. The biggest, pushing the idea that Donald Trump won the election. That's right, we're finally gonna talk about January 6th. But before we jump down one of the worst rabbit holes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, I'm going to give us all a breather and place the ad segment right here because I just feel like we all could use a very quick, like, you know, little two and a half, three minute mental break before we dive back into this hell hole. So allow me a break. If you'd like to skip it, feel free to. If not, this is a moment to cleanse. If cooking is a pain in the butt for you, then I have got a solution for you. It's HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you choose from over 55 weekly options featuring pre-portioned high quality ingredients picked at peak ripeness. HelloFresh delivers fresh quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week, so you can savor all of your summer and fall flavors right from home. And one of my favorite things about HelloFresh is how easy it is to customize every single step of your process with them. I love how easy the app is to use and how it is to keep up on your orders, when they're coming in, when you need to skip one, et cetera, et cetera, change your meals out, it's super easy. But the other thing that I like about HelloFresh and what I've been really into recently is their Hello Custom options. So you can swap out proteins or sides for something different. 
Recently, I've been going through another phase again where I just don't wanna eat meat products. I can't explain it. I just go through these phases once every like couple months where for like two, three months, I, the thought of meat, it just the, grosses me out. And I'm going through one of those phases again, which is really nice to customize meals to make them more vegetarian friendly so that I can eat and enjoy all the same recipes just with a little veggie twist. So if you wanna get started with HelloFresh, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash casket16 and use code casket16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Again, go to hellofresh.com slash casket16 and use code casket16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. When you run a business, time seems ever more precious. Every misplaced moment feels like a missed opportunity, a lost chance to make your business better, or even just step away for a moment and recharge. ShipStation gives e-commerce sellers like you more time to do what they really love. Unless of course you really do love managing every little detail of order fulfillment, then just ignore this. But truthfully, I don't know anyone that does, so listen up. What's great about ShipStation is it automates time-intensive shipping processes, so you can get back to focusing on bigger things. And it's gonna work with all your storefronts to include Amazon, eBay, Etsy, and more. You can easily compare carriers, rates, and delivery times, so it's easy to choose the best option for every shipping scenario. And you're also gonna get crazy deeply discounted shipping rates that are normally reserved for Fortune 500 companies. It is an absolute relief to know that when it comes to shipping products, I don't have to worry about fighting over, oh my God, do I do this or do I do that? ShipStation has it all laid out, easy to read, easy to understand, easy to pick, and easy to just get going. So sign up using promo code CASKET for a free 60-day trial today at ShipStation.com and start saving time with every shipment. That's two whole months of shipping made quick and painless, and it's free to try. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in CASKET. ShipStation, make ship happen. January 6th should have been a normal day. The Senate all comes in together with the vice president to officially confirm the new president of the United States. It's gone off without a hitch for nearly two centuries, and yet this year, it was different. On that very day, thousands of people gathered outside the Capitol building to hear speeches and protest what they believed to be a stolen election, an idea that had been peddled by Donald Trump and other prominent politicians and news platforms. The situation quickly evolved into a day of violence, anger, and an attempted insurrection. It's now a day that will be stained into the core of US history forever, a day that we are still trying to learn more about and push further accountability to this very moment. Who was one of the people who was in the middle of this? Well, Marjorie Taylor Greene, of course. If you look up virtually any news story about her, you'll find a picture of her donning her infamous Trump One mask on the floor of Congress. From the very day she stepped into the office, she constantly posted on social media to spread the lie that Trump had won. It was the typical stuff. Stop the steal, voter fraud, mail-in ballots from dead people. You know, the normal reactions from politicians after an election. Her biggest rallying cry was that Trump could have never won in her home state of Georgia. She said on OAN, I know we're not a blue state. I know for a fact that President Trump won here in Georgia. I feel it 1000%. I'm not quite sure how she knew this for a fact. Maybe it was in the same way that she knew for a fact that space lasers had caused the California wildfires. Either way, she was a key voice behind what some people now call the big lie, which stoked the January 6th insurrection. Soon, she would have to answer for it. Before long, there was an official legal challenge to her candidacy for 2022, based on her involvement in the insurrection. After it was discovered that she had tweeted 1776 the day before and text leaked insisting on implementing martial law, she was called forward to testify in Atlanta, Georgia to plead her case. While in front of a judge, she continued to stand by her idea that the election had been stolen, but she claimed that her insistence was to call to challenge the election, not for people to become violent. But let's think about that logically for a second, just just a second. If people are really convinced a United States election had been ripped away and rigged, What do you think the reaction would be? Is it not even a little shocking that the constant rhetoric that democracy had failed and an election had just been given away would lead to violence? And she undoubtedly had a hand in stoking that fire. Either way, Marjorie Taylor Greene seemed keen on answering questions about things she had posted or said, I don't know, or I don't recall. She argued that she had no idea that posting 1776 was a call for violence. What exactly did she think that meant then? Did you think it was time for some nice tea parties and pastries to calmly express political opinions? Cause I highly doubt that's what she was thinking. Interestingly, her lawyers even called her a victim of January 6th and said that the push for her to lose her candidacy was a political smear campaign. Still, they argued that she had not committed any overt acts of insurrection. And I mean, she wasn't outside with the people, she just had lit the match. 
What does that matter, right? Apparently, it doesn't matter at all because it seems the argument had won over the judge. In May, she was deemed qualified to run for re-election. So here we all are dealing with the fallout of that decision. Fun. Despite the atrocious comments made by Marjorie before and during her stay as a United States Congresswoman, she still holds on to her seemingly unwavering popularity. She holds steadfast to her ultra-conservative views, celebrating the fall of Roe v. Wade and adamantly arguing against gun control in the most concerning way physically possible. Recently, one of her tweets raised eyebrows as she suggested that guns were the only way people were going to protect themselves from the trans agenda, among other things. It read in part, "'Passing red flag laws was not a solution by Democrats to stop mass shootings. It will be a tool to disarm any gun owner that wants to stop abortion, the trans agenda on kids, mass illegal immigration, and big government oppression suffocating out families, faith, and freedoms." I took that as a threat or call for violence against transgender folks, and I'm not the only one, but still it's up on Twitter right now. Go figure. But she has developed a new shtick, going after rhinos, otherwise known as Republicans that aren't quite conservative enough, or I think it's Republicans in name only is what it stands for. And by that, she means people who aren't loyal enough to Trump or those who have attacked her or her good old buddies, Matt Gates and Lauren Boebert. Though her friendship with Lauren has apparently come into question after the two had to be separated when Marjorie gave a speech at a white nationalist convention. And I am also 100% serious about that. That happened. Still, Marjorie has become a major oppositional force for these so-called rhinos, and it's a huge aspect of her reelection campaign, which I still can't believe is a thing that's allowed to happen in the first place. In fact, in April, 2021, Politico argued that Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene would be going on what they called the America First Tour, dedicated primarily to going after rhinos. Well, and the radical left, of course. Time got the rare opportunity to follow the Congresswoman on her campaign tour to see what she does every day. They start off the resulting article by listing the things she's done throughout her career. You know, the misinformation, the conspiracy theories, and you know, the introducing articles of impeachment for Joe Biden two days after he took office. Still, Marjorie did her very best to explain to Time that this was all just blown out of proportion. She is merely a woman that doesn't back down from fights. She claims and is under attack by both her own party and the radical left. So just ignore all the stuff she's done and said. She's just a super confident young lady and defensive about her opinions, that's all. Her campaign signs have gone a step further than they were before. The Stop Socialism has now been replaced with Stop Communism. And now there are new ones that read Impeach Biden. Of course, there are stickers and bumper stickers too, if you so chose. Marjorie Taylor Greene responds to her adoring fans by saying she's working to impeach the president, but the others don't want to rock the boat. She keeps up with the rallying cry against abortion and immigration reform, saying that patrol agents are now apparently suicidal because Biden has tied their hands. Her fans carry signs with her name surrounded by hearts, and even ironically, the feminist quote, well-behaved women rarely make history. It's no question that despite or because of all the atrocious things she has done and said, she's loved by her voters. This became abundantly clear as she won her reelection primary. It is looking like we're in for another two years with the controversial Congresswoman, and she just seems to become bolder as time goes on. So the question is, what's next? Probably nothing good, but hey, I just read a lot. What do I know? But with all of that being said, that is where we're ending today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I have the ever just, I don't know, slight gut feeling that we'll have to revisit this topic in the future because she's probably gonna shit all over the floor again sometime soon. But for right now, that is where we're ending today's episode. And I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you being here today and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. So for now, goodbye, and I hope to see you soon.